and welcome to The Piping Show. My name's Andrew Bova. It's my pleasure to once again be your host this week where I'll be joined by Donald McPhee. Donald's active in just about every aspect of piping that you can be, from teaching and competing. He's a gold medalist and a six-time world pipe band champion. Piping for dancing and making reeds, the man does it all. If you like this content, please do like, share, and subscribe as it helps us to grow our audience and reach more pipers all over the world. Before we go to the history segment and to our interview with Donald, let's go first to our news correspondent, Helen Urquhart, with today's news. On Monday, Piping Live announced its big band event for this year, which for 2023 supports the Versus Arthritis charity. It's open to chanter players, pipers, bass, snare and tenor drummers, as well as drum majors. We're also on the lookout for stewards to help marshal the event. If you would like to take part in the Piping Live big band for this year, go to pipinglive.co.uk to register now. This week, it was announced that the Silver Chanter organisation has passed from the National Piping Centre to the Peeber Society. There won't be an event this year, but it will start with a five-year sponsorship deal from the Torveig Distillery from 2024. The event will be held at Salmor Ostig in Skye. Events coming up this weekend are the Newton Stewart and Mini Gaff Junior Piping Competition, which takes place at the Mini Gaff Primary School. This is part of their traditional music and dance festival on Saturday the 8th of July. Also this weekend is the Skagit Valley Highland Games in Mount Vernon, Washington. This is organised by our friends at the Celtic Arts Foundation and our director, Finlay MacDonald, is taking part as a featured performer over the weekend. Donald, I know we've just completed the interview that you're all about to see, but thanks for agreeing to stay and talk about this. This is a, for our viewers at home, this is a reed making machine that we have in our museum. Now, I walk by this every day and I know nothing about it. So I thought this was a good opportunity for you as a reed maker to maybe point out some of the things on this machine for our viewers at home and of course to satisfy my own curiosity. Right on, yeah. So what are we, what are we looking at here? Well, it, 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 this looks like a, a, a gouging machine for a number of different types of, uh, uh, of reeds and practice channel reeds, small pipe reeds, and even pipe channel reeds. Uh, we, we've got a gouge, an in canal gouge here, okay? okay. And the, the slope is not that severe. Uh, and then you have more of a, a bigger radius slopes on the ones that are Trans. down here. You can tell uh, that's what we call an in-canaled gouge, just meaning that, that, that the radius is cut on, on the inside instead of the outside. Uh, and and when, when the cane comes from raw material, uh, we need to create that radius on the inside of the blade in order for, for it to... Uh, uh, to work as they say instead of just having it be the the radius that's the natural radius of the cane okay and then what are we looking at over on on this side here yeah well th this this looks adjustable and it looks as though you can move that and that that would create the slope on both sides of of the of the blade okay mm -hmm. so you would have you would have the radius on on the blade and then you would need to turn it over which would be uh, the outside of the blade or, or or the ones that we see and that would create the slope with the adjustability of that in either direction that you needed to do run it over that way and create the slope on both sides you, you need to create the one um, that you don't see that's where the wrapping is at because uh, um, in order to wrap that around a piece of metal, the the staple, brass staple or copper staple, uh, it, it 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 needs to have a uh, it needs to have a slope to it too, so okay. uh, that that it's able to wrap around it. Right. How unusual. I mean, that's it. Seems like quite a lot of tooling and quite a compact kit. Is that is that quite an unusual thing for a reed making machine? Uh, it, yes. Yes, it really is. The the somebody uh, uh, a really really smart uh, engineer did this. Um, what uh, um, and and the different the different radiuses to create the the radius on uh, the inside of of the cane. So uh, a, a lot of these a lot of these guys when when my grandfather. When my dad's dad worked at Ford's, 
Uh, that's 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 what brought him to Detroit. He had a mate of his who was a glass blower, and make um, blades out of glass uh, for oh, a pipe okay. chain to read. And so uh, my dad, uh, my grandfather started or tried to start making uh, reeds out of that. The, the, um, the problem was was that when the moisture went on the inside of the glass with it vibrating back and forth, it caused the glass to shatter. So it right. was it, it, it was a non-starter, but uh, we're we're talking back in 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 you know pre-World War II kind of a thing. The the um, with with the jobs that these these pipers were doing, uh, i.e. the McAllisters that had had um, friends or had had one of the family that works to, that worked at Cummings Diesel, so uh, they had they had. Um, uh, availability of a machine shop in order to I need a machine that'll do this or I need a tool that'll do this right oh, okay and then you've got guys that are tool and die makers that just kind of come up with it no bother whatsoever um, so the, somebody quite ingenious um, uh, did this and uh, said look you you can you can make them for practice channel reads you can make them for pipe channel reads you can create the slope you can do this you can do that with it so um, yeah uh, uh, it's certainly a cool piece of kit oh it, it's it's great if, if if the modern day read makers were, were were looking at at the tools that I use they would probably say that that it was a it was a, uh, a grandson of, of, of what you see here um, so yeah uh, that's that's to create to help create the blades of a pipe channer or the blades of a practice channer or small pipe reeds. Right. Well, thank you very much for coming in and shedding a little bit of light on this, this mystery. Um, if you'd like to see this reed making uh, tool, it is on permanent display in our museum here at the Piping Center. Donald, thanks for coming to join us today. Always a pleasure to see you. Um, we'll start with the same question we ask everybody. Uh, how did you get into piping? Yeah, uh, uh, real pleasure to be here, uh, and uh, uh, thank you to the National Piping Center, everybody involved here at the National Piping Center for all that you do for bagpiping. So uh, I got involved in the bagpiping because my dad was a piper, and um, there, there, there was no way I wasn't going to be a piper. Uh, he never forced me in order to play, but uh, at the dinner table at nighttime, well, Donald, did you practice today? And you know, I had to look at him and go, no, Dad, and I, I just got the look of disgust, you know. Right, you know, and, and you never want, at least I never wanted to experience that off of, uh, off of my dad or basically anybody, you know. Um, so my, my grandfather on my dad's side was a piper and can go back, uh, go back four, four generations from my grandfather up in South Uist. So yeah, I was going to be a, I was going to be a piper whether I liked it or not. And thankfully, so, uh, it's, it's shown me all parts of the world. Yeah. Well, speaking of all parts of the world, uh, for anybody listening at home who doesn't know or might not notice, it's a, a couple of, well, I think I can say Yankee to you. I yeah. mean, I know oh, you, 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 you spent some time in Texas and Florida, but you, born in Dearborn, Michigan. Absolutely. Uh, just a, an yeah. hour north of where I grew up in wow. Perrysburg, Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, but then you, you spent time in, in Florida mm -hmm. and some time in Texas. Yeah. And I was doing a wee bit of, of reading about the, the St. Thomas Band and then a, a little further back, and as I understand it, you were involved with the band that was maybe the precursor to the St. Thomas Alumni Band. Was That's that, correct. Is that correct? Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, the, the, just to kind of explain, you know, you, uh, in Scotland, uh, when when you hear the name McPhee, McPhee by name, McPhee by nature, you you grew up in one, you're born in one place, you grew up in another, and then and then you move to another place. My my uh, both my parents were. We're born in Detroit, Michigan, and um, then we moved down to Dunedin, Florida, 1975, when my dad got the, uh, the teaching piping job uh, in Dunedin, Florida. The, that's the one uh, that, that Ian Donaldson has right now. Uh, prior to that, it was Sandy Keith. Prior to that, it was Ed Krenz. Prior to Ed Krenz, it was my dad, and then um, uh, moved, to, moved to Houston, Texas. I uh, went to the University of Houston. So, yes, the when um, when I moved to Houston, um, uh, the 
there was a band there called the Hamilton Pipe Band, and it was it was called the Hamilton Pipe Band because um, a fellow, uh, a student of my dad's actually, uh, Lars Sloan, had the Hamilton School of Piping. So therefore, uh, he, he got the band going called the Hamilton Pipe Band. And at the same time, there was a Hamilton Police Pipe Band. And so when, when we were competing, it was a wee bit of... Uh, wee bit of confusion there but yes um uh took took that band and took them all the way through to uh the u.s champion uh, grade two in, in alma michigan we competed at the Celtic classic um up in the east coast and on the west coast monterey highland games and santa rosa santa rosa highland games on two different occasions we we were <laughs> we 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 got a sponsorship from Noodle Roni, so we were actually the Noodle Roni pipe band at one of the one of the Pleasant and Highland Games competitions. So uh, so yeah, the and uh, a lot of a lot of of the players in the band um, were um, sons of 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 pipers that were involved in the Houston Highlanders, and some that were involved with the. St. Thomas Episcopal School that were taught there. And so, yeah, um, uh, that, uh, when I left to move to Scotland, uh, that continued on with the Hamilton Pipe Band. I believe that they won the grade three world championships in 97, I believe, uh, 98 possibly. And then uh, it kind of died out and then it was resurrected again with the St. Thomas, what's called over here, alumni pipe band, but <laughs> the St. Thomas alumni pipe band, which uh, um, is led by uh, pipe major Jamie Gattinger, uh, Mike Cusick, and uh, Nick Hudson. Yeah. So those those are the leaders in the band, and uh, I believe Graham Brown is the leading drummer. So uh, that's right. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, it's funny you're talking about having two bands with a similar name. We don't seem to be terribly creative with naming pipe bands sometimes. <laughs> I remember when I played in the Frasers, right. you know, we had the, seven, yeah, the 78 Frasers, and then there was also 78 Halifax. Absolutely. And I remember, oh, I think it was King Carden, and they were announcing the results, and they said, first place, 78s, and we all went <gasps> to start cheering, and they went, Halifax, and just absolutely, you know, deflated instantly. But yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, sometimes you need that we. Oh, absolutely. That we kicked to get going. Um, now, you mentioned then you moved to Scotland, and it was 97. 97, um, yeah. Can I ask what precipitated your move well, to Scotland? Uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, I married the most beautiful woman in the world, Christine Lacey. We, uh, we got married in September 97, and um, Christine was involved in the bank um, in management, and um, um, so she had a very, very good job, and uh, uh, I moved over here, and... Uh, yeah, life life started for me living in Scotland due to due to uh, marrying Christine and uh, yeah. Uh, well, so Christine, of course, is a, a world-renowned dancing adjudicator, hugely involved in the dancing world. Was it through Christine that you got so heavily involved with piping for dancing, or were you, was that something you were doing before you? Or is that how you met her? Uh, no, no. Well, at the. Uh, I got involved piping for dancing because my two sisters were Highland dance teachers, and they were teaching uh, in in the studio in Dunedin, Florida. And uh, my dad really encouraged it because it meant I was playing more. Yeah, so uh, I would play for their dance classes and start doing it that way. And um, like I said, uh, my dad was was not a big fan of the practice chanter. Once that was a learning. That's how you learn the tunes. Once you've got the tunes, then start playing it on the bagpipes. So, um, playing playing for my sister's dance dance classes, doing it that way, and then started uh, started piping for dance in a contest really all over the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, I met Christine when she she came over to Houston, and they have uh, they have a set steps. That it, it, it's kind of like the way that the pee bricks change every year. The steps kind of change every right, year okay. for the different four Highland dances. So the the examining body send over teachers in order to teach the teachers the, the new, not the new steps, but the steps that have been chosen for the next year's championship kind of thing. And so met her there. And yeah, it was uh, love at first sight for me, but it, it took her a couple of years to come around in my line of thinking, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, you're, you're a man of great resolve. That doesn't surprise me. 
Um, <laughs> now, you know, we, we've talked about Highland Dancing. You come in and do a course in Highland Dancing for the RCS uh, students every year. Um, and it seems that, you know, you've, you've said to me in the past, I don't know if you still think this, there seems to be a dearth of pipers who are interested or willing or able even to do it. So what, for somebody who maybe doesn't want to compete, I think about this sometimes, there's so many students who go, well, I don't have an interest in competing or playing in a band. Maybe Highland Piping for Dancing is a good route to perform and, and be involved in the community. What advice would you have for somebody who is interested in getting into Piping for Dancing? Yeah, I, I, I get, a lot of, uh, get a lot of communication from um, pipers who, who young child is becoming involved in Highland Dancing and they want to start uh, finding out information about Python for Dancing and the difficult part about Python for Dancing is one of the foundation uh, one of the foundation dances is is the sword dance and not only is that really difficult on the dancer because they have to dance around swords across sword and not touch it but um, it's one of the most technically demanding tunes that we have in piping um, uh, Gilly Callum, so uh, in order to play that and in order to play it rhythmically correct, it, it's it's really really difficult, unless what I call your dedicums or your strispe tacums or the they have a uh, they have a different name all over the world uh, are really strong. Then it's 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 actually quite difficult uh, because it's it's basically a dance that's danced at every competition um but uh yeah it, it, it's it's had me it piping for dancing has had me see uh all over the world i've i've piped for dancing competitions all over the world and um uh yeah it's 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 uh uh i find it easy because i i've done it at such an early age you know um uh, and the course here, of course, at, uh, at the Royal Conservatoire, the, they learn everything that they need to know to become a professional piper or a better piper and stuff like that. And part of that is piping for dancing. And, and uh, the, the great part about it is, is that they learn that. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's to young, young, really, really, really good players who want to, uh, who want to see the world and uh, do things on the traditional side of things and mm -hmm. all that. So, uh, uh, hopefully, when when they settle down and and they they have at, at least the knowledge or um, the the wherewithal to, to start piping for dancing, but yeah, it's 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 not. Uh, um, it there's a lot of pressure that's put on yourself when you're piping for dancing because of the fact that you're you're like a football referee or you're like a uh, an accompaniment to a really great singer. If you're heard, there's something wrong. You know, if if, right. if 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 there's an issue with you, then you haven't done your job on the day. So um, uh, and um, so yeah, it, it's you, you just have to be prepared and and uh, willing to help anybody who, who wants to foresee and go through and start piping for dancers because we we definitely need them out there. You know, I'm mm -hmm. 57 and still doing it. So nobody's on the sidelines going, hey. Big Donald, away, away you go. Let me in, you know. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Okay. Uh, and play a big read, right? Like the biggest read you can, because <laughs> you're going to be playing all day. So. Uh, <laughs> um, now, of course, I, it's it's sometimes when I was thinking about getting ready for this interview, it's it's a wee bit difficult because you do so much. Um, I was actually when I was sort of looking at your page and you know reading a wee bit about you, I went, you're, you're kind of the modern John Ban Mackenzie of piping, <laughs> and that you do it all. Um, so you know you're a you're a reed maker as well. Yeah. So I was wondering, could you tell us? I mean, how did you get into reed making? But yep. then also, the the average piper's experience with reed making is very much um, you know you get in touch with you and get reads sent through and mm -hmm. there you go you've got your reads uh, we don't think about the the sort of process of making reads so how did you get in read making and then what are the challenges of being a read maker right uh, the well I I, uh, I played with a band up in Canada uh, called the Dunvegan pipe band and the pipe major was Scott McCauley the pipe sergeant was Colin McClellan and uh, um, I I, I, uh, I worked for Colin McClellan Worked at, at the did menial stuff, just uh, tidying up the workshop and just preparing stuff and and not doing anything that he was doing that was critical. 
So I kind of caught the bug there, really, really caught the bug there. And then uh, Jimmy McIntosh sold uh, McIntosh bagpipe supplies to Mike Cusick. And uh, the, um, when I was in Houston, uh, I was working at a, um, at a machine shop, working my way through university. And uh, uh, th through Mike buying the business, we, we were able to duplicate Jimmy's tools and uh, started, started read making that way. Um, um, uh, a very, very difficult, di difficult business. Not because I do it. Uh, um, what what you're doing is is you're making a double reed that stays in a chamber, so it doesn't have an embouchure. You don't have direct contact onto the reed, and uh, combine that with the conical bore of the pipe channer. Uh, makes it really, really, really difficult. That's why there's not many. Uh, uh, bagpipe reed makers, chanter reed makers that are out in the world today, uh, a lot of a lot of drone reed makers and stuff like that that try to get into the chanter reed, but it's a uh, it's a totally different beast. With with uh, with drone reeds, you're dealing with with steps of a cylindrical bore, a straight bore, uh, and their steps with with the internals of of the pipe chanter. It's a conical bore, um, so that that's what really really makes it tough. Uh, um uh how 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 did i uh how how did it really catch on with me uh the um when jimmy mcintosh and murray henderson moved over to the states um they they sold nail pipe chanters and the the states had had uh basically every every um every piper uh had a nail pipe chanter and at that time when i started reed making um, with most of the reeds that were being made, the the Fs would double tone on it, mm. and um, so I thought to myself, well, if I can make a reed where the Fs don't double tone, I'm off to a winner, and um, uh, was able was able to do that, and um, so there therefore um, uh, supplied reeds to pipers so that they could start using their their nail pipe channer again. And that's that's nothing against nail, nothing against whatever. It's just, it was one of one of the one of the difficulties with the chanter. Mm -hmm. um, a great great chanter, without a doubt. Um, 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 but in the states, that's that's what what the pipers were experiencing over there. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's funny you say that. I remember when I was starting, you know, sort of back in the early two thousands. Uh, that was the reputation of the nail chanter. Was it's a great chanter, hard to read. Um, but just because uh, there's so much ground to cover, um, <laughs> I, I want to. I do want to ask you. So we've talked about this before. Okay. By my count, you are the winningest American Grade One piper of all time. Right. So okay. six six World Pipe Band Championship titles and 33 major championships. 34, if you include the one with Scottish Power. That that. Right. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, uh, when I was playing with Scottish Power, I think in '99, uh, the band won the Cowell Championship. So. Right. Okay. 30, 34 in total. 34. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Jizo. Um, <laughs> and of course now you're you're you know out of the bands and into the adjudication side of things. So, mm -hmm. you know, heavily involved. I mean, with education as well, and um, of course you're prolific solo player but in in the pipe band side of things you know you'll you'll have a different experience coming with such a breadth of knowledge from competing now into adjudication and hearing the sort of trajectory that bands are going on what do you think about what's happening musically within the pipe band community especially in in grade one and where do you see it going where where do you think maybe it should go yeah, well, uh, yep. Yeah, uh, the I've been been an RSPBA adjudicator now for I think in eleven years, I believe, uh, an ensemble adjudicator now, uh, I think four years. So, um, where where is it going to? Well, the uh, the music board, uh, in conjunction with the uh, the pipe majors of the grade one, uh, have decided to go down a route of them having an MSR of only four parts. Four part march, four parts to spay, four parted reel. Um, so they have um, they have one set like that, and then kind of um, uh, no no confines with the other march to spay and reel. Um, I I I I can see where they're coming from. The inspiration, the drive was that the. Uh, the crowds would experience more tunes because the the uh, the pipe bands were picking 
all the same same tunes, the Highland Wedding. So when you went to a competition, then you might hear six Highland Weddings and six Blair Drummonds and that kind of a thing. So in order to change that, that's what they decided to do. Um, uh, unfortunately, I, 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 I think... Uh, I, I think it, it it puts even more pressure on the adjudicators, yeah. Because, What's that? Well, you're 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 only adjudicating four parts of a march, four parts of a stray, of a stress bay, and four parts of a reel. Um, the, if if I was adjudicating that competition, um, you, the the bands are giving me less to adjudicate, and therefore making it more difficult in order to come out with with a result. Um, whereas the, 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 uh, when one band comes on, let's just say with Donald McLean's for Walter Oban, you know, and another band comes on with Abercrombie Highlanders, you know, uh, um, Donald McLean's for Walter Oban is technically in, uh, one of my foundation tunes. Um, and you've got Abercrombie Highlanders, which is one of the most difficult two part, four parted two fours. So, uh, um, uh, in my opinion, judging a confined contest like that is is more difficult than judging an open contest where they can pick any tunes that they want, uh, as long as they have the four parts. It, if I can, it's similar to uh, you've got the Masters competition here. Yeah, mm -hmm. we get we get our tunes when we play at it a fortnight beforehand. Mm -hmm. Now. If I was adjudicating that competition and I had my choice, I would much rather have the Pipers get their tunes 10 minutes before they come on than them not giving, you know, two weeks in order to, to prepare to play a March to Spain reel and a Peabrook. Um, so the, uh, the, so the, that's my thoughts. What, what I would have done, what I would have done was t to ask for another March to Spain reel. I would ask for three so that when, when it's drawn out of the hat, if it is drawn out of the hat, that it's either one, two or three instead of right now, the bands know that they're playing this MSR and then know that they're playing this MSR. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I just wonder if, are you saying one of those, one of those three should have been a four part at MSR? Oh, or just it, it, or own choice, whatever, whatever, right? Whatever they want to do. What, it, what, you know? It, it, it's, it's uh, um, the. Um, that's if, if I had anything to do with it, that that would have been my voice as far mm -hmm. as it goes. But um, uh, this is the route that they decided to go down upon, and so uh, heard some some lovely tunes. And unfortunately, I was fighting for dancing at Aberdeen, but uh, heard some some nice. Nice tunes, it, it, uh, if I can say, uh, the, the uh, Maura Gramsci, which Bog Hall and Bathgate played, was a, was a, a big favorite of my dad's. So right. uh, I, uh, I didn't know about it, stuff like this. So you're, you're there making reads and you've got YouTube and mm -hmm. you're hearing, uh, I think it was the big rap show that, that, that had, had the playlist that was up there. And so all of a sudden you hear it come on and you're like, oh, Maura Gramsci. And, and it's... It's it's times like that that you really wish that my dad was around and you'd pick up the phone and go, hey dad, you know, I yeah. listen to this, you know, and um, but yeah, so uh, uh, a really great tune that was a fa favorite of my dad's. It was not one that that I ever competed with, but uh, so it, it, it's it, it's done its job in one way. Mm -hmm. uh, I just think uh, uh, it's it's made it difficult on the adjudicators. So okay. Well, I think that maybe brings it full circle back to your childhood there um, <laughs> and a good place to stop. So, Donald, thanks for coming in. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Always good to see you. Dr. Bova, thank you very <laughs> much. And again, uh, uh, the National Piping Center, thank you for all that you do for, for bagpiping and uh, to, to spread the gospel of the music of the bagpipes. Thank you.